Hi. My name is Gil Fanchulo. I am the director of the pain center at Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center. I am a physician. I am board certified in anesthesiology, pain medicine, and hospice and palliative medicine. And I've spent the last 10 years of my career pretty much focusing on the use of opioids in the treatment of patients who have chronic pain. So the people that I'm talking about are not people that have cancer pain and not people who have pain from multiple sclerosis or any of those other very serious illnesses. The people I'm talking about are people that have chronic pain. They have back pain that's lasted for years and years. They're my patients who have been injured uh, in an accident or some other way. I saw a patient this week who was working on a construction site and fell down carrying some sheets of plywood and landed right on his bottom and got a contusion of the sciatic nerve. The sciatic nerve is the big nerve that innervates all the muscles and sensations in your leg, and it can be excruciatingly painful to have an injury to this nerve. So this is the type of patient who may benefit from the use of these drugs. I'm going to be discussing a proposal for a new way to manage patients who suffer from chronic pain with opioids. When I talk about opioids, by the way, I'm talking about drugs like morphine and oxycodone, methadone, those types of drugs. Some people call them narcotics, but narcotics is not really the right term to use. Narcotics is any drug that makes you drowsy, and opioids are drugs that are derived from the plant opium, from the opium poppy seed. So any drug that's derived from that plant or any drug that's made synthetically to resemble drugs derived from that plant is called an opioid. And so I'm, so I'm going to be talking about the opioids. I have a couple things that I want to add right up front. The first is, is that I have no conflicts of interest. I don't work for pharmaceutical companies. I have no connections with pharmaceutical companies or any other business entities that are associated with the sale of these drugs. So hopefully what I tell you will be my opinion as unbiased as it can possibly be. The second thing I want to tell you is, is that the main purpose of my being here today is to try to convince you that there are people that benefit from the use of these drugs. There are very wonderful people and my wonderful patients who are helped by these drugs. Because there's, the, because there's been such a lot of bad publicity about the use of these drugs, we're worried that they're not going to be as accessible to our patients as they are right now. So for example, we know that in the states of New Hampshire and Vermont, more people are dying from prescription drug overdose than die from motor vehicle accidents. So this is a terrible statistic, but we don't want to have such a backlash from this statistic that our patients who really benefit from these drugs will not have access to them and will, will not be able to get them anymore. At the same time, there really is a public health crisis. These deaths and all the injuries that are occurring because of the use of these drugs are troubling to me and they're troubling to all the doctors and nurses and to all the people in our communities. The fact of the matter is, is that the people that are overdosing from these drugs are not getting these drugs from Canada and they're not getting these drugs from Mexico and they're not getting these drugs from the internet, they're getting them from me. I write prescriptions for opioids and all my colleagues, the doctors, the nurse practitioners and the PAs in our states write prescriptions for these drugs and we can't tell who are the patients that are benefiting from these drugs, who are the patients who suffer from the disease addiction and need a different type of treatment and who are the patients who might be criminals and might be diverting these drugs. I'm going to start by talking about the ways doctors manage their patients traditionally. And this is the way that I manage my patients most of the time and the way that most nurse practitioners and PAs manage their patients. They manage their opioid patients just like they manage all of their other patients. The patients come into the office, the doctor or nurse asks how they're doing, the patient tells them how they're doing, there's an honest relationship, a face-to-face -face relationship with our patients, we trust them and believe them and we give them prescriptions for opioids. Now, there are dilemmas associated with the prescription of opioids. These dilemmas have been studied. So, for example, if I see a patient who I'm not really sure is a good candidate for treatment with opioid pain medicines, but I don't take the time for whatever reason to really investigate further, and I give them a prescription for opioid medicines, I'll go home and lie in my bed and my eyes will be open and I'll be thinking that I made the wrong decision. 
Likewise, if I see a patient who I don't prescribe opioids to when they feel that they could benefit from the use of these drugs, but I decide that I don't think that that is the case and don't prescribe opioids to them, I go home and I worry, again, that I made the wrong decision. Because there's not a lot of science associated with selecting who we're going to prescribe these drugs to or not. And doctors are influenced by a lot of different variables. One of the the influences that's had a profound effect on doctors is advertising from pharmaceutical companies. And pharmaceutical companies who make these drugs are likely responsible for a lot of the overprescribing of opioids that some people might describe, might describe exists today. But these dilemmas of uncertainty are only one part of the dilemmas associated with, the, with prescribing these drugs. The other dilemmas are what are called time-consuming events. In this day and age, when you come to see me in the office, I can't keep you waiting for an hour, and I can't keep you waiting for two hours. It may be that in the 1970s and 1980s, that was an expected event if you went to see the doctor. But in this century, that's not an expected event, and our patients expect, and rightly so, to be seen on time. Patients who are prescribed opioids often present with what we call time-consuming events. So they want to have an increase in their dosage or they have a urine toxicology specimen that doesn't show the drug that they were prescribed, or they have a new pain issue that they hadn't described before. And so they come in with another problem that may add a half an hour or 45 minutes to the visit and delay me for the rest of the day. So these time-consuming events are very disconcerting for me, and they're very disconcerting for all the providers in our country now who are trying to stay on time. The practice then, if you look at these dimensions of it, can be described as somewhat unfulfilling for, for providers at times. It's different when you see a child who has uh, an ear infection and you prescribe ampicillin and their infection goes away and they're 100% cured. And it's different if you have a broken wrist and you have a cast put on and three weeks later the problem is solved. These are problems that aren't solved quickly or easily. They're very complicated. And if every time you see a patient with one of these problems, they disrupt your schedule and they keep you awake at night, then this is a problem for providers. And it's a big problem for providers. It's such a problem that many providers in the states of Vermont and New Hampshire have decided that they are not going to prescribe opioids to their patients anymore at all. They've just taken it off the table regardless of what the problem is that the patient suffers from. And this is not the right solution either. I can personally recall back in the 1970s taking care of cancer patients that uh, were not treated with opioids. Their doctors were afraid to treat them with opioids because they were afraid that they would become addicted to drugs. And we would have patients literally crying in pain when their doctors wouldn't treat them compassionately. So we try to be more compassionate now, and I don't think any of us would say that that's the system that we should go back to. But somewhere in between that system and the system we have right now is really the right way to manage patients. Doctors do need to learn how to say no to some patients, and they do need to understand how to assess their patients and stratify their patients better, identify the patients who suffer from the disease addiction, separate them from the patients who, tr who suffer from chronic pain. Treating a patient who suffers from the disease addiction with opioids is just like if you break your thumb and you go to your doctor's and your doctor gives you a prescription for ampicillin. It's completely ridiculous. It, does, it makes no sense. It hurts everybody. And that's the same situation that we really have now if we're treating our patients who suffer from the disease addiction with opioids. One of the other issues in caring for patients who suffer from the disease addiction is that these poor folks have an overwhelming desire to obtain these drugs, and they'll, they'll do almost anything to get, the, to get the opioid medications. And so it's not uncommon for them to lie to their doctors or to their nurses or to their PAs in order to assure that they'll be getting drugs. And, it's, and I can't tell who's lying to me and who's not lying to me. I live in a world where almost everybody, and I'm very fortunate to live there, I live in a world where almost everybody I speak to I think tells me the truth. And so when you're in a situation where a certain percentage of your patients are actually lying to you in order to get a drug, it's a very artificial situation. And it's a situation that most doctors and, or nurse practitioners or PAs are really unprepared for. So again, the purpose is to identify patients who benefit from the use of these drugs and make sure they have those drugs. 
identify patients who suffer from the disease addiction and make sure you offer them treatment for addiction. Addiction is a treatable disease, and if you apply the right treatment, those folks can be treated too. And also to identify patients who are diverting their drugs, identify people who are criminals posing as patients and not provide them with opioids so that we don't hurt our neighbors and our neighbors' children. So we've broken this down, and, and the slide that you are looking at now displays all of the steps that are involved in me just seeing a patient and giving them a prescription for opioids. On the surface, it seems like a very simple problem, but it's not a simple problem or project at all. It's very simple if I sit in the office and if a patient comes in and tells me, doctor, my shoulder hurts and it's hurt me for two years and I need a prescription for OxyContin, and I say, okay, no problem, and write them a prescription for OxyContin. If I want to practice medicine that way, then, then it's a relatively simple practice until I realize, and hopefully someday I will realize, that I'm hurting a lot of people by practicing that way. And so the way we really need to practice is we need to analyze all of the necessary elements of taking care of a patient with chronic pain for whom we plan on prescribing opioids. And this slide is, a, is an overview of all of the steps, and I'm going to talk about each one of these steps individually. So the big categories for these steps are qualify and stratify. So there are patients that it's obvious to any layperson that we should not prescribe opioids to them. And if a person comes into my office, and I, of course, have images in my head as I talk of all the patients that I have seen. So a patient walks into my office, and he has a swastika tattooed on one shoulder, and he has an obscene tattoo on the other shoulder, and he's extremely threatening. He's a big, young man, very threatening, in my personal space, tells me that he just got out of prison and that before he went to prison, he was using OxyContin. And I don't mean to discriminate on people who are in prison, by the way. Uh, he tells me that before he went to prison, he was using OxyContin, and he's here now for me to prescribe his OxyContin to him, and he has low back pain. And all his studies are negative, and his physical exam is normal. And I tell him that he is not a candidate for treatment with opioids, and I will not prescribe opioids to him. He is already intimidating me, even at the outset, and he frightens me even further as I give him this news. And even further down the road, he reports me to the Board of Medicine in the state of New Hampshire for discriminating against him because of his lifestyle choices. So these are the types of patients that we see, and I have worked with a very well-known psychologist who has given me advice on how to manage these patients, a patient like this. And she tells me, do you want a small headache now or do you want a big headache later? And so as big as the headache was for me to tell this gentleman that I would not prescribe opioids to him, it would have been much bigger had I prescribed opioids to him down the road. It's very hard for me and it's very hard for other doctors under circumstances like that to tell people that we are not going to give them what they want. Okay? The next step is to stratify people. This, this gentleman was an obvious bad choice for treatment. But some people were not so sure about. A person who has a broken arm and injury to the nerve in that arm and has objective evidence of a painful disorder, we know that this, man arm, this man's arm hurts. But he has a history of heroin addiction in the past. And so we want to treat this man with opioids, but we recognize the fact that he's at increased risk for developing a problem with addiction if we do treat him with opioids. And so we'll still manage this patient. We will treat this patient with opioids. We'll involve our addiction medicine colleagues. We'll carefully monitor him. We'll talk to him and educate him about what the risks are, et cetera. But, but this is a high-risk patient. This patient is going to have to be watched more carefully, perhaps, than other patients. But this is a patient that we are going to continue to prescribe opioids to. Education is a part of this process that gets lost in the process all the time. And the problem is, is that it takes time to educate our patients. These drugs are so complicated, and there are so many different varieties of situations. It's almost not possible for me to educate patients in a single one-hour visit or even in a couple-hour visits. So part of the process that we're proposing is that education is going to be a big component of it. And we are going to have web-based educational modules that our patients will be required to view. 
A good example of why this is necessary is if I were to talk to you about the side effects of opioids. And so I'm seeing my patient and I say, well, I'm, we're going to give you a prescription for Percocet, which is an opioid, and the risks of taking this medicine are addiction, constipation, sexual dysfunction, hypogonadism, hypotestosteronemia, there's an increased risk of fractures, there may be an increased risk of osteoporosis, there may be an increased risk of certain types of infections, and there may be an increased risk of certain type of tumors. So I know as soon as I say that, that my patient gets almost nothing out of that explanation. Okay, they stare at me with their mouths open and I can move right along to the next part of the visit, but I know they get nothing out of that explanation. If I want to take the time, if I want to spend an hour talking about the risks associated with the use of these drugs, then I could do that and I, and I should do that. But many doctors don't do that because we just don't have the time to do that anymore. And so these educational modules are going to be a way for us to educate our patients about the risks of using these drugs, to educate our patients about the potential benefits of using these drugs, and to educate our patients about what, what my responsibilities are as the provider and what their responsibilities are as the patient. And we've stratified our patients into high risk and moderate risk and low risk categories. So a low risk patient, for example, is my young woman patient who had a vaginal hysterectomy. And she had her feet up in stirrups for about an hour and a half. It's a position called the lithotomy position. And her legs were up in the air for about an hour and a half. And this stretched the sciatic nerve in one leg. Again, this is the very large nerve that innervates the, the whole leg. It innervates all the muscles and all the sensory nerves in the leg. And when this nerve gets damaged, it's excruciatingly painful. And so she had damage to that nerve. We can prove that she has damage to that nerve. We can do what's called an EMG, which measures the nerve function in her leg. And so we know we have objective evidence of a painful disorder. She has none of the other risk factors that we associate with addiction or diversion. She has objective evidence of a painful disorder. She has no personal history of alcoholism or drug abuse. She doesn't smoke cigarettes. Her, she, her mom and dad never had a problem with alcoholism or drug abuse. She's employed. All of these things mitigate against the fact that she's ever going to develop a problem with addiction. And so she's a low-risk patient. So if I see my low-risk patient and she calls me up and she says, you know, Dr. Fanchulo, I lost the prescription you gave me. I don't know how it happened. Then I'll replace that prescription for her. If a high-risk patient, on the other hand, calls me up, if the patient that has a recent history of substance abuse, of alcoholism or drug abuse, if that patient calls me up and tells me that he or she lost their prescription, then I'm going to have to treat it entirely differently. And that patient will have been told, because they have viewed these educational modules in advance, that if that happens, that I will not replace that lost or stolen prescription and I really cannot replace that lost or stolen prescription. So part of the educational program are FAQs, just like we use these FAQs in so many different areas. What happens if I have cocaine in my urine? What happens if the drug that you're prescribing to me is not found in my urine? What happens if I lose a prescription? What happens if my prescriptions are stolen? What happens if I overuse my drugs and run out early? So our patients are going to hear all of these questions before they ever get prescribed an opioid, and they will also hear all the answers before they ever get prescribed an opioid. So they will know what the consequences are if they don't, if they don't um, adhere to the requirements that make the use of these drugs safe. Okay, and that's, it's as simple as that. And we're going to treat our patients in brief visits. So because of these time-consuming events, it disrupts the practices of a lot of doctors. So we're going to have very brief visits for all of our patients. The visits are going to be 15 minutes. The visits are going to be done by nurse practitioners or PAs. And the visits are going to be conducted just for two purposes, really. One is to make sure that the patient has their prescription, and the other is to make sure that the patient understands how to use it and is using it properly. And so at this visit, we'll give our patients a prescription for opioids. We'll question them about whether or not they're constipated or whether or not they feel sedated. And if all those things are fine, then we'll give them their prescription and they will leave the office. If they have a new pain, or if they want an increase in their dose, they're going to have to make a separate appointment and come back at a separate time to visit us. We want to take care of our patients who have those problems or complaints, but we can't squeeze all these new problems into our day-to-day -day practice very easily. 
if we find that we cannot safely provide these drugs to one of our, pa our patients, we don't fire them. We don't tell them that we're not going to take care of you anymore. What we do is we tell them that there are many ways for us to treat your pain and that the opioids are just one way to treat your pain. And the other ways include other drugs. They include behavioral medicine interventions, helping you harness the power of your mind to help control your pain. They include operations and injections. And they include physical medicine approaches. We know that if we stick somebody in a hospital bed for three days, that they're going to ache all over. But we know that if you get up and exercise, you have fewer aches and pains, and your pain in general is less. So if our patients are open to other types of treatment, then we have many other things to offer them other than opioids. The other major component of this, of this program is what we call report. And if you look at the literature, if you look at all the medical literature and say, well, there must be some evidence to support the use of these drugs in certain patients, we must know what the risks are of taking these drugs, et cetera. Some of the things that I've already told you, they're based on very poor evidence. There's not a lot of evidence in the medical literature to support the use of these drugs, even what we call long term. And by long term, I mean a year. I take care of patients who have been prescribed opioids for 20 years. And I can't tell them that there's any scientific evidence to show that these dro drugs continue to work even after one year. And I can't say that there's any scientific evidence to show that there's not some harm that will occur, occur to them if they use these drugs for 20 years. Um, so we want to gather evidence. So we want to prescribe drugs to a large number of people, which is exactly the opposite of what most providers want. But we want to prescribe drugs to a large number of people so that we can study those people. We believe that cigarette smoking is a risk factor that will help identify people who are more likely to develop a problem with addiction. We believe this is true. But it's not really proven unequivocally to be true, even though we do make that assumption whenever we see somebody. This is another reason, by the way, to quit smoking, especially if you have chronic pain. If you walk into my office and you tell me that you're a cigarette smoker, I will increase your risk category for developing a problem with addiction from low risk to moderate risk or from moderate risk to high risk. So not that you need another reason really to quit smoking, but it's just a little bit of an, an aside and a little bit of editorialization to say just another reason to quit smoking. The report part is as important as any other part of this project that we are going to do in our opinions. We need to learn how better to take care of patients who have all of these problems. Another part of this situation is the fact that it's very hard to tell if people are actually doing better or worse. And so if I see my patients to whom I prescribe these drugs and I say, so how are you doing? And they'll say, I'm doing, I'm doing well. So that is such a broad response that I really can't tell you what it means. I don't know what it means when my patient tells me that he or she is doing well. My patients will come into my office and, I'll, and they'll tell me, doctor, doctor, I'm doing pretty well, but I think I need an increase in my dose because I'm still having a lot of pain. I will explain to my patients that all you can really expect long term from the use of these drugs is about a 30% reduction in pain. Patients who suffer from chronic pain are different from patients who suffer from cancer pain. If you have cancer and you come into my office, I can almost guarantee you that I am not going to let you die in agony, okay? But if you have chronic pain and come into my office, I can not even come close to that. I would have to tell you that the strongest drugs we have are opioids, and the opioids are likely to only reduce your pain by 30% over the long term. Some people will get more relief and some people will get less, but that's really the number. So any patient that has an expectation of complete pain relief using these drugs is going to be disappointed. You don't get complete pain relief from using these drugs. And so when my patient asks me for an increase in dosage, what I'll often do is I'll say, well, how would you do without these drugs? If you didn't have these drugs that you're taking right now, what, what would your life be like? And the answer is typically, oh my god, I couldn't get out of bed in the morning. I would just be miserable. And so then I'll try to explain to them that the dose they're on is probably the right dose and they don't need an increase in dose. And that any increase in dose will increase their risk of side effects. And I don't think it would help reduce their pain any further than where their pain is right now. 
Another thing that's changed is it used to be that we would be pretty satisfied if somebody told us that they had relief of pain. So we use an instrument called a, a verbal numerical scale. When I see my patient for the first time, I say to them, if zero is no pain at all and 10 is the worst pain you could ever imagine, what number would you put on your pain right now? And I'll ask them, what's the average number you'd put on your pain for the last week? What's the highest number you'd put on your pain for the last week? What's the lowest number you'd put on your pain for the last week? That's about the best we can do, really, in assessing the severity of our patient's pain. There is no test for pain. We can't do a functional MRI. We can't do any kind of test that proves whether or not a patient has pain or not. So we have to rely on patient self-report. But there are instruments, and this verbal numerical scale is an instrument that helps us measure the severity of a patient's pain. And so when a patient comes into my office before I treat them with opioids, I will write down those numbers. I'll treat them with opioids and I'll ask them those same numbers in a month and I'll ask them those same numbers in two months and three months. And if I find that those numbers haven't changed after three months and I've been treating my patient with opioids, then I question whether or not I'm actually helping the patient. It's a little more complicated than even that, because it may be that the patient's pain is the same because they've been much more active, because they've actually had less pain. And so we're also going to measure when we see our patients their functional abilities. And we have different instruments that help us measure that. We have an instrument, for example, called the Oswestry Disability Index. And this asks questions like, how, far, how many flights of stairs can you walk up? How far can you walk? Um, can you go to work? Do you, can you give yourself a shower and can you shave yourself? All of these kinds of questions. It's a way for us to gauge how functional our patients are. So if this same patient has an increase in their Oswestry Disability Index, but their pain, ra pain rating is the same, then I'll say, okay, that is success. Okay, because this patient is doing a lot more now than he or she was doing before, and their pain is the same. The other part of this that we have to look at is mood. And many people who suffer from chronic pain also suffer from depression and anxiety. And it's, it's the depression and anxiety that occur with chronic pain is not a pre-existing condition. Patients who've never had a problem with depression or anxiety before develop a chronic pain problem, and they have about a 75% likelihood of developing a major depressive disorder if they have uncontrolled chronic pain. And so this is just one of the symptoms of chronic pain. And we want to measure mood as we go along also. This might be a good time to tell you what the definition of chronic pain is. Chronic pain is just pain that lasts longer than it should have. And so if you have a hip replacement, most people who have a hip replacement have virtually no pain a month after their hip replacement. If you still have pain three months later, then that's an indication that you might be suffering from chronic pain. Now, a definition of pain is another thing. We all know what pain is, but it's very hard to define. So the definition, the formal definition of pain is that pain is an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience. And the important part of this is that it is always sensory and it is always emotional. People feel when they have pain that if they cry or if they become depressed that this is some type of innate weakness in their personality. And it's not true. We can do studies like a functional MRI scan and put a, a clamp on somebody's finger and squeeze it down and see what parts of their brain light up when they have pain. And it's not only the sensory cortex of the brain, the part of our brain that tells us where the pain is, it's also all of the emotional centers of the brain that will light up as well. So it is a sensory and emotional experience. And the second part of the definition is that it's associated with actual or potential tissue damage or expressed in terms of such damage. So the important part of that is you don't really have to have a bone sticking out of the skin in order to have pain. You can have pain without any evidence that you have pain. And as time goes by, we get better and better at making diagnoses. And I think 100 years from now, people will, will look back at me and they'll say, boy, he was so primitive, you know, how could he possibly have even gotten by with the, the tiny amounts of knowledge that he had, which is similar to the way we look back 100 years right now and judge the, the physicians and nurses who took care of our patients before. 
And so we know people suffer from pain. We know that the bone's not sticking out of the skin. I don't think there's any difference from the pain that somebody has, whether the bone's sticking out of the skin or it's not, or if there's another origin for the pain. Could come from a stroke. So we have all these ideas about better ways to treat our patients who need opioids and have chronic pain. How do we operationalize this? How, how do we, we put it into function? And I'm going to talk about that a little bit. The patient comes into my office and requests treatment with opioids. The first thing I'm going to want is I'm going to want all the notes from previous providers. I want to know that the doctor that was taking care of this patient before did not stop prescribing opioids to this patient because this patient had a problem with addiction or was diverting his or her drugs. I want to know that the doctor that was taking care of this patient before had a good experience prescribing opioids to this patient, if indeed they were prescribing opioids to them before. Before I will treat anybody with opioids under this new paradigm, they're going to have to view educational modules. And all of the patients will have to view three different educational mod modules. The first module is, is entitled Risks and Benefits, and I've already spoken about that a little bit. The second module is called Patient and Provider Responsibilities. And the third module is Treatment Objectives and Measurement of Successful Treatment, where, where I will talk about the use of the instruments with my patients before I ever treat them with opioids. So they're going to know what I'm looking for, and they're going to know what I'm looking at. This is an honest relationship. Everything is on the table. I want to help my patient, and I'm not trying to fool them or trick them, trick them into giving me an answer which will dissuade me from want to conti wanting to continue to treat them. I will also obtain a urine specimen from all our patients. We have learned that if you rely just on patient report, that you are not going to identify a large percentage of patients who may suffer from the disease addiction. And so we did a study, it must be almost 10 years ago now, I would say, where we looked at how many more patients did we identify who suffered from the disease addiction if we tested a urine specimen than if we didn't test a urine specimen. And we found that we identified almost a third more patients. And so that to think that patients who suffer from the disease addiction are always going to reveal themselves, they're always going to have a lost prescription or they're always going to have a stolen prescription, is pretty foolish because people who suffer from the disease addiction are just as smart as people who don't suffer from the disease addiction and they know they're, they're smart enough to fool me, okay? For me to think that I'm going to rely on the fact that they're not so smart or they're going to screw up, that's a mistake. And so if I really want to help people who suffer from the disease addiction, then I do need to test urine specimens. And, the, and it's a mainstay in the addiction community. Patients who suffer from the disease addiction and are treated for the disease addiction often have their urine specimens tested. And doctors and nurses know that you will improve compliance. You'll improve the success rate of patients in recovery by checking urine specimens, then, and you'll have a higher chance of success than if you don't check these specimens. So using these specimens as a way to identify patients who suffer from the disease addiction is an extremely important part of this protocol. So every patient, when they walk in the door, I'm going to get their complete history. I'm going to make sure that they're educated about what we're talking about. I'm going to obtain a urine specimen from them. I'm going to do a complete history and physical examination on them from top to bottom. I'm going to make sure that they have a primary care doctor because I am not a primary care doctor. I don't have the skill or talent to take care of this patient if he comes in with an earache or she comes in with shoulder pain. I don't really know how to do that. I'm very limited in the scope of my skills. My skills are in the area that I'm talking about, the treatment of chronic pain and addiction. My skills are not in the area of a primary care doctor's skills, which are very extensive. The patient is going to sign a, a, a form that has changed names about every three or four years. It was initially called a contract, but this seemed to be somewhat of a pejorative term to call this agreement, so we called it an opioid agreement. Now we call it a pain management treatment plan. But whatever you call it, what it really is, is an opioid agreement. It's a written agreement so that the patient understands what his and her responsibilities are. The patient understands and signs a form stating that he or she understands what the risks and benefits are. And it also outlines my responsibilities as their provider to them if I'm going to prescribe these drugs to them. 
We'll, we'll determine the opioid dose at this first visit. We'll assign them a risk category. There'll be a low risk, a moderate risk, or a high risk patient. If we're not sure if we should prescribe opioids to them or not, we will convene a committee of psychologists, doctors, and nurses who will meet and discuss whether or not we should prescribe opioids to this patient. Low risk patients will be treated differently from moderate risk patients and will be treated differently from high risk patients, as I've already discussed. But even patients who we think are low risk will provide us urine toxicology specimens monthly for three months, then every three months for nine months, and then annually thereafter. They will review a web-based refresher educational module at least annually, and they'll get their prescriptions from us monthly uh, during a brief visit. There are many practices that do prescribe opioids to patients uh, on a three-month basis, or the patients can stop in the office and pick up their prescriptions. But we feel it's important that I actually see my patients every month. I want to see my patient every month. You know, people develop problems with addiction in times of stress. And so my patient may be a wonderful patient, and years have gone by, and they've never had a problem with abuse of their drugs or addiction to their drugs. But all of a sudden, their wife left them, and their dog died, and their mother died, and they're under terrific stress, and they've lost their job. They're under enormous stress. These are the times that people can develop a problem with these drugs. And so I don't know when that's going to happen or to whom that's going to happen, but I think it's important that I see my patients every month so that I just can tell you that they look okay, that they sounded okay when I spoke to them, and that they didn't relay to me that there was some new horrible event that was occurring in their lives. Moderate risk patients are going to give us urine toxicology specimens monthly for a year, and they're going to see an addiction specialist. And we have a very close relationship with the addiction doctors at Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center, and they are completely on board with this project. So if you smoke cigarettes, you are at moderate risk for developing a problem with addiction to opioid pain medicines, and you're going to meet with one of our addictionologists. And it would be really useful, I think, even to help you quit smoking to meet with one of our addiction doctors. If you're a high-risk patient, you're going to be co-managed along with our addiction medicine specialists. You may not suffer from the disease addiction, but we want people who specialize in this area to be available to you, to help you, and to give you information, and to help you recognize if you might be developing a problem with addiction. We're going to see our high-risk patients weekly for two months. We're going to see them every two weeks for two months, and we're going to see them every month thereafter. And we're going to obtain a urine toxicology specimen from them every time we meet with them. It, it is possible to change risk categories. So, for example, I have a patient who I've been caring for for probably eight or nine years, and he's a, he's a lovely guy, um, and he had a problem with addiction to heroin a long time ago. But over the eight or nine years that I've been managing him, he has never displayed any behaviors that have worried me. He's never had a urine toxicology that was inconsistent with his reported use of drug. And he has had some very stressful events occur in his life and has weathered them without difficulty. He's not a high-risk patient anymore. Okay? He's shown me that he's either a moderate-risk or a low-risk patient for developing a problem with addiction. So we're going we're gonna to try to keep our patients as safe as possible, but it is possible to change these categories. The monthly visits that, that our patients will have will be brief. They'll be 15 minutes. They'll be with a mid-level provider, and they're going to be protocol-driven. The rules that I've described to you are the rules that we are going to follow because we want to depersonalize decision-making to some degree so that our patients don't get mad at us. They don't get mad at me. They can get mad at the system, but they will, they will know what the rules of the system are, system are before we ever start. And they will know that if they deviate from the plan, that it's not me personally that's making a decision about them. It's the system that they signed up for has, has decided that it's not really safe for us to treat them with opioids anymore. I think it's pretty clear, if you look at the number of deaths that are occurring from prescription drug overdose, that the old management paradigm has not worked very well. 
and it's time for a new management paradigm. And I think by incorporating some of the rules and some of the structures that I've described, that we'll be able to take really good care of our patients who suffer from chronic pain, give them opioids when they need it, identify patients who shouldn't be treated with these drugs, and offer them treatment that is probably more suitable for them. Thank you. Um, the, the name of the clinic, and we've gone around in circles on this because we wished we could come up with a good acronym. And so we're calling it the Safe Opioid Use Practice, which is SOUP, which is not a really good acronym. But we can't, we've really been unable to come up with anything better. So if anybody has a better idea, please let us know. We've started seeing patients, and we are seeing a small number of patients right now because we're trying to fine tune the system. So in March of 2014, we're going to start to open this up to referring providers. We have a number of different hospitals in our community that are interested in participating with us. These include Mount Escutney Hospital in Vermont, New London Hospital, some of the North Country New Hampshire hospitals. And, um, and we, we would anticipate that ultimately we're going to be seeing patients at a lot of different centers in both states. So it'll be more convenient for our patients to come and see us. Um, Cancer patients tend to respond better to the treatments that we give them because they just haven't had the pain for so long. As time goes by, if we have chronic pain, the way our spinal cord interprets those painful signals and the way our brain interprets those painful signals actually changes. If you think about the benefit of pain, the benefit of pain is that it warns you that something bad is about to happen to you. So if you put your hand on the oven, and it feels hot, you pull your hand away and you don't get burnt. But with chronic pain, you put your hand on the oven and you pull your hand away and it still burns. And that, that happens because of changes in our bodies, the changes in the central nervous system that, that force, our, force us to continue to experience those painful um, responses even though the painful stimulus has gone away. And that's chronic pain. Often there is no bone sticking out of the skin. Once you tuck the bone back in the skin, the pain should go away. When it doesn't, it's because of changes in the uh, central nervous system that cause this pain to last and last. There was a very famous um, German physician who no one knows who he is, and I, and I have, or she is, and I have a slide um, that I use occasionally. And what it basically says is, thank God for the fact that we have opioids because we have nothing as strong and we have nothing that works as well for patients who have severe pain. Um, if you take the cancer pain population, when I, well, I was speaking earlier about the fact that I, even though I'm still a very young man, I can remember patients in the hospital who doctors would not prescribe opioids to because even though they were dying of cancer because they were afraid they would suffer from the disease addiction. Now I see these patients in my office with chronic pain and they're miserable and they have real reasons to have pain, and I think the opioids are useful for them. I think, so, so what are the consequences of untreated chronic pain? People who have untreated chronic pain have a shorter life expectancy, they have an increased risk of infections, they have an increased risk of blood clots in their lungs and in their legs, so they have an increased risk of depression, anxiety, all types of mental illnesses. So the risks of untreated chronic pain are actually quite, quite high too. And you might say that the risks of opioids, it, and I, I would even change that. I wouldn't say you might say, I would say you would say, and it's, I believe it's definitely true that the risks of using these drugs in a low-risk patient exceed the risks of not treating their pain at all. And for the moderate-risk patients and the high-risk patients, I'm not sure if I, can, if I can really make that same statement. I don't know where that will fall out. Well, we have a very comfortable patient resource center at Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center where you can come and sit down and one of our volunteers will put these videos on for you and you can watch them right there. 
Every patient that we see at the Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center Pain Center, we access via the Vermont Prescription Monitoring Program, whether they live in the state of New Hampshire or Vermont. We access it for every single patient that we see. We think that it is an extremely valuable and an extremely important part of managing our patients who are treated with opioids. And we can't wait until New Hampshire's program is up and running. And the thing that we'll want after that is we'll want other states to communicate. I want to know, are my patients going to Vermont or are they going to New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Maine, or New York? to get their prescriptions. And all these states have prescription monitoring programs. It'd be nice if they could communicate with each other and it would help me take safer care of my patients. Is, acute pain is a different thing also. And there are problems with the way doctors treat acute pain. One of the most commonly cited problem is that doctors overtreat acute pain. So if you have a hip replacement, your doctor may give you 120 Percocet tablets. They'll say you could take one you know, four times a day for the next month, and they'll give you 120 tablets. And you may only need 30 tablets or 60 tablets, and now you have 60 or 90 tablets that uh, are in your possession that you don't really need. Um, and so it's a difficult problem to try to estimate how many pills a patient needs after an operation. Part of the reason for that is that there is a 10-time variation, 10-fold variation in people's opioid requirements based on genetics, based on past experiences, and based on a lot of things. Some people will have a hip replacement. They'll take three Percocet tablets, and they'll be totally fine, and that's normal. And some people will have a hip replacement and need to take Percocet for two months, and that's normal too, really. And so we can't really judge, but we have to do a better job about not allowing so many of these pills to get into the community. And we have to do a better job also, and this wasn't part of your question, but I'll throw it in there too, about what to do with these pills when you have them in your house. And the thing to do with them is get rid of them. You know, we use so much of these drugs, we use so many of these pills in the United States that opioids are measurable in most of the drinking water in the United States because people flush them down the toilets. And so we don't advise people to flush them down the toilet anymore. The other thing is, is if you have children, and I know your children are the best children in the world and would never do anything terrible, um, but these pills are part of the culture of young America. And, uh, and your children will steal your pills. And I don't say all of them will, but if you have a 14-year-old and you have Percocet in the medicine cabinet, it's a temptation for your 14-year-old at the very least. And so you can't keep these pills in the medicine cabinet. Um, you can't keep them in the sock drawer or the underwear drawer because people who come into your house to, to do repairs or, or friends who, uh, who visit, They'll look in your medicine cabinet and they'll look in your sock drawer and they'll look in your underwear drawer to try to find these pills and, and they'll steal. They won't steal them all, but they'll take five or ten and you may not know that they've taken them. This, this part of it has been looked at. And so really the best thing to do with these drugs, if you have these drugs in your house at all, is to keep them in a lockbox. And if you're going to hide them, don't hide them in the sock or underwear drawer and don't keep them in the medicine cabinet. So I think the most important points I want to make are number one, we need to have these drugs to help our patients who suffer from chronic pain. And we want to make sure that our patients who suffer from chronic pain continue to have access to them. In order for us to ensure that, we have to make sure that we're prescribing these drugs appropriately. And that means that we're giving them to our patients who can benefit from their use because they suffer from chronic pain. We need to identify patients who suffer from the disease addiction so that we can offer them the right treatment and we need to identify people who might be diverting these drugs and not give these drugs to those folks.